Hello and welcome to National 5, Unit 1, Carrier 5, Genetic Engineering. In today's lesson we are still on Unit 1, Cell Biology, and we are now on to our second last topic of Unit 1, Genetic Engineering, which is Carrier 5 out of 6. Once again, I just want to draw your attention to the SQA Mandatory Knowledge, or course specification document, and you can see here in the first two columns all of the content you must know for this topic, as this is what you'll get tested on in assessments or exams at this level. You can see that this is quite a short topic, but this is one that people do tend to find quite difficult to understand, so I'm going to try and break this down into small chunks as I can. So today's learning intention is to learn about genetic engineering and by the end of today's lesson I hope you'll be able to give examples of when genetic engineering can be used and also describe the stages of this process. Now before we start any new theory I want to try some quick starter questions on some previous knowledge from topics that will relate to this one. So pause the video here and attempt these questions and then play again when you're ready to go over the answers. Okay. So for question number one, it says to draw and label a bacterial cell. So over here, sometimes they look different, sometimes they're drawn along the way, and that's absolutely fine. Um, so we have a cell membrane on the inside, cell wall on the outside, cytoplasm, ribosomes, and then we have a plasmids, so multiple of these in the cytoplasm, and then in the middle, we have our bacterial chromosome. Now, the main thing to remember here is that bacterial cells do not have a nucleus. Um, their DNA is free in the cytoplasm in the form of a bacterial chromosome and multiple plasmids. What is the difference um, is different about the way that DNA is stored in bacterial cells compared to other cell types? Well, I just kind of said it there. So DNA is stored in the nucleus of other cells, whereas bacterial cells have no nucleus, so their DNA is within a bacterial chromosome and plasmids. Finally, what do you know about how bacteria reproduce? Now, we haven't covered this in any of the National 5 topics so far, um, but this is something you may have covered in National 4, um, and it is quite important for this topic. So they replicate they can replicate asexually and within this each cell divides into two cells which are identical to the parent cell and contains the same plasmids or bacterial chromosome. So for example this cell would split into two daughter cells that were identical to one another and this becomes really important when we look at our final stages of genetic engineering later on. So the first key point in this topic is to be able to describe what genetic engineering is. So genetic information, so DNA, the genetic code, can be transferred from one cell to another by a technique called genetic engineering. In most cases, we're talking about taking a gene from one type of cell or organism and placing it within the DNA of a completely different cell or organism. There's lots of weird and wonderful examples I could give you for this, but to keep things as simple as possible with, which, with what is considered to be a generally complicated topic, um, I'm only going to focus on examples you would need to know for the exam or ones that come up most often. So one use of genetic engineering is to take human genes and insert them into a bacterial cell plasmid, the plasmids we saw on the diagram before. Now remember from Caria 3, genes are sections of DNA that code for proteins, and this means taking the section of DNA that codes for a specific protein that humans make and putting that code into a bacterial plasmid which doesn't usually code for that protein. Now if you insert that modified or changed bacterial plasmid, the one that now has human DNA in it, into an actual bacterial cell, then that cell will then make human protein. Now the importance of this is that we can therefore use bacterial cells to produce proteins that we can use to treat people with certain medical conditions. It's only one of the uses, but this is one of the main uses. So bacteria are fairly cheap and they're quick and easy to grow, so this makes them great kind of mini factories to make proteins we need for medicine. One example of this, the most common one in National 5 questions and exams, is the hormone insulin. Insulin is a protein that we normally make um, as humans, but when it isn't produced or is produced in low quantities by a human, they have a condition called diabetes, which you'll hopefully have heard of before. Now, this means that those people with diabetes need to inject insulin, and we'll come back to more specific detail on insulin when we get to one of our topics in Unit 2. But insulin for people with diabetes used to be extracted from the pancreas of dead pigs and cows from abattoirs, and this obviously wasn't ideal, and it could also cause allergic reactions in patients. So now we use bacterial cells to mass produce the human insulin protein um, for people with diabetes. So another human protein that we can engineer bacterial cells to produce is the human growth hormone, which is used to treat some growth disorders. Um, this is another one that's quite common in exams as well. So I would know these two as quick examples in case they come up in any questions. So the most important thing you need to know from this topic is the stages used in the process of genetic engineering a bacteria with a human gene, which is represented in this diagram here. This is a really common extended response question and you must memorise all of the stages and be quite specific with your wording. 
A quick tip is that some tests or exam questions use insulin as the protein example, but others may use a different protein, or they might just say it's a general protein that's being made. So make sure you read the wording of the question so that you can add the word that matches. So for example, I'll teach you the stages and just refer to the required gene or required protein in my steps. But if the question says insulin gene or protein, then you can say insulin gene or insulin protein within your answer instead of just saying required gene or required protein. So you can kind of change the wording to make it better match the question. So let's start to go through the stages. So stage one is where you identify a section of DNA that contains the required gene from the source chromosome. Now that's the wording you need to say, but let's break this down by looking at the diagram. So here we have a human cell, and within the human cell is the nucleus, which contains DNA in the form of chromosomes. Chromosomes are made up of genes that each code for a different protein. We know that from Karia 3. If we want our final bacterial cell to make a specific protein like insulin, we need to identify or find the gene that codes for insulin in the human cell. So you find the chromosome, within the nucleus um, that contains that gene. Um, so we identify or find the gene that goes for the insulin in the human cell. So you find the chromosome, identify the gene or section of DNA on the chromosome here that codes for insulin. Um, so that's what stage one is. So we identify the section of DNA that contains the required gene from the source chromosome. In stage two, now that we find that um, that gene that has the code for insulin or the required protein, we need to actually take that gene out of the chromosome. We don't need the whole chromosome, we just need the gene. So we say extract the required gene from the chromosome. I've said here using enzymes, but I'll come back to this later on. So we've identified the gene we want in the human chromosome, so we found it right here, and we have now extracted it from the chromosome, so we just have the gene. So in stages one and two, we focused on the human cell, but now we're going to move on to the bacterial cell. So here we have a bacterial cell and we want a plasmid um, so we can put the human gene into it. Um, so we extract the bacterial plasmid from the bacterial cell in stage three. So you can see this bit that we went over the top, but in this one here, we're extracting um, our bacterial plasmid from a bacterial cell. And then to make room for the new human gene, the plasmid is then cut open, which you can see here because there's now a little gap. We can't put this gene in without there being a gap in the plasmid. Now again, this step uses enzymes and I'll come back to the reason for that again soon. So now we have the human gene, which has been taken from a chromosome in the human cell. And we have cut open the bacterial plasmid, which was taken from a bacterial cell. In stage four, what we now do is we insert the required gene into the bacterial plasmid and then we seal the plasmid and again this uses enzymes. Moving on to our next stage we now have a bacterial plasmid with the human gene inside it. So you can see this plasmid here has a little black line here, that's the human gene that's now within that plasmid. Okay so this is now called a modified plasmid because we've modified or changed it by adding the human gene. This modified plasmid cannot do anything on its own, this one here, um, it's just a piece of DNA and we know that um, for the DNA code to be used to make a protein we need ribosomes and other kind of things within the cell are needed to do that. So this modified plasma needs to actually be put into a cell so that, so that it can be used to make the human protein that we want. So stage five is to insert the modified plasmid into a host bacterial cell to produce a genetically modified organism. Now you may have heard the term genetically modified organism before genetically modified organism or GMO. This is an organism that has foreign DNA in it or DNA that isn't usually found inside it. So in this case, the host bacterial cell now has human DNA inside of it, which now makes this a genetically modified organism. So they were the main stages of genetic engineering that you need to see in an exam. However, I don't think this process makes complete sense unless we finish it. So once the genetically modified bacterial cell has been created, like in our example before, um, so yeah, once it's been created containing a plasma with the gene in it, the bacterial cell then divides. Now remember I said right at the start that bacterial cells when they reproduce make identical cells to themselves when they reproduce asexually. Well this means that when the genetically modified bacterial cell divides, the cells it produces will also be genetically modified and contain a copy of the plasma with the human gene in it. And you can see that in the diagram here, they've all got that little black line in it, so the little gene um, from the human cell. 
Now this means quickly you'll have hundreds or thousands of millions of bacterial cells that can make that human protein because they have the code, they have that human gene. Finally, once enough bacterial cells have been made um, and they've made enough of the protein we want, we can then isolate and purify that protein so that it can be used. So for example, in the case of insulin, that insulin protein can then be used and given to diabetics. So now that we've covered all the stages of genetic engineering that you need to know, just to run through them one more time. Okay, so we start with the human cell and we identify the section of DNA um, that codes for the that contains the required gene from the source chromosome. We then extract that required gene and then at the same time we take our bacterial cell, we extract a plasmid and then we cut it to make sure it's got space for the gene. We then insert the required gene into the plasmid, so we have a modified plasmid and then we take that modified plasmid and put it into a host bacterial cell to produce a genetically modified organism. We then let that bacterial cell or genetically modified bacterial cell divide and produce the required product, which we can then take and isolate after. The final thing you can be asked about genetic engineering is the use of enzymes in this process. Now, remember we covered enzymes in our last topic. They speed up chemical reactions and remain unchanged. Well, three stages of genetic engineering need enzymes to be able to work. One type of enzyme cuts the useful gene out of the chromosome and it also cuts open the plasmid. And you can see them in these two stages here. So to remember where this enzyme is used, think about where there's cutting going on in this process. The other type of enzyme is used to seal the gene into the plasmid, so it acts more like a glue. And it's this process you can see here. So the stages that use enzymes are circled in the diagram here. And if you want to know which stages required enzymes um, in the ones I spoke about, it was stages two, three, and four, according to the numbering I used. Now remember, though those stages might be numbered differently in exams or tests so it's not enough just to remember two three and four as your numbers you must be able to identify the stages from diagrams or wording if they only show you parts so wherever the gene or plasmid is cut and wherever the plasmid and gene are sealed together are where enzymes are required and it's really important you know it it's a really common question in the exam so that's us finished going over Caria 5 genetic engineering. I hope you now feel confident that you can describe the genetic engineering stages. And if not, don't worry, it's not the easiest topic. Feel free to go back and watch the video as many times as you need to until you can describe these stages easily. I would also suggest trying to draw out and label each stage to practice and even draw out the stages and try and put the stage numbers and full descriptions beside them and keep doing that until you can do it really easily. Thank you for listening.